You guys have been showing a ton of love to our strategy videos, and a lot of you guys in our strategy videos requested that we talk about Superflex League. So we wanted to uh, not discriminate against our two quarterback folks. So today we're going to be breaking down a lot of our Superflex strategy. We're going to break down exactly what Superflex Leagues are for those of you guys that don't know, how you want to value quarterbacks, you know, some of the mistakes you want to avoid, the value over replacement factor of quarterbacks, and then some other considerations. And like we did in the other strategy videos, we're going to break down a mock draft at the end where both of us are employing some of the Superflex strategy points that we talk about throughout the video. So uh, Danny, how you doing? Doing well, doing well. And yeah, if you guys have been following along with us during the Dynasty offseason, you'll know that in Dynasty, Superflex is all we play. However, we're learning the Superflex redraft format. Did a lot of research for this video. So hopefully we can provide some insight to you guys. Yeah, I've played in a couple Superflex leagues over the years, so I've definitely gotten my lay of the land. But definitely, we always want to be backing stuff up with data on this channel. And uh, you guys really seem to like when we do that. So we are going to break down everything that you need to know about Superflex leagues. But first, we got to hit the intro. All right, so Superflex Leagues, by definition, if you are totally new to fantasy, you have no idea what Superflex means, basically, it's a league that instead of a traditional one quarterback setting where you'd have like one quarterbacks, two wide receivers, two running backs, there's an additional flex spot where you can start a second quarterback. And most often you want to start a second quarterback because generally speaking, it's easy for a quarterback, even if they're not very good to put up like 15 points, a lot harder to do that. If you're just like a rando running back off of the waiver wire. So this adds a crazy new dynamic in fantasy scoring where quarterbacks suddenly get pushed up the board. The most valuable position in sports becomes the most valuable position in fantasy. And you can see some of these elite quarterbacks like your Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts of the world go where they probably should be going, given their value to their actual NFL teams. And if you guys are new to Superflex, we'll definitely be sure to go over everything. And obviously, when we do the mock, we'll outline some of the strategy stuff. So how to value quarterbacks properly becomes like the number one factor in you know, evaluating how your super flex strategy is going to go. And it also could depend very much league to the league. If you're in a super flex format, that's been super flex for 10 years, people probably know how to value the quarterback position. But if you're in a super flex format, it's your first year ever doing super flex. And all you've played in is one quarterback leagues. And all your league mates have played in is one quarterback leagues. Then you can really, really take advantage of people misjudging the quarterback position. So I'll let you take it away. Kind of with the differences in value um, among the quarterbacks based on those like elite guys, the low end quarterback ones, you know, the high end QB twos, because this factors in a little bit when it comes to like the late round quarterback strategy in one quarterback leagues, but is especially important in super flex. Yep. It's absolutely massive in super flex. So I looked through the last three years and kind of bucketed the quarterbacks in terms of the top six guys, your low end quarterback ones being your quarterback seven to 12 your high-end quarterback twos being your quarterbacks 13 to 18, and your you know low-end quarterback twos being your quarterbacks 19 to 24. And as you can see there, every single year, 2022, 2021, and 20, we do find that the quarterback one to six range on average provides about a 51.7% advantage to that of the low-end quarterback twos being in that quarterback 19 to 24 bucket and vice versa, quarterback seven to 12. 30.4% advantage a quarterbacks, 13 to 18, a 10.4% advantage. So a lot of mumbo jumbo, the three year averages that you guys should be taken away from this is that the elite quarterbacks provided a 21.7% edge comparatively to the low end quarterback ones. We'll get into it in a second that the low end quarterback ones were still a massive gain, but having an elite quarterback was so much more valuable than any other uh, spot between the buckets. The difference between the elite quarterbacks and the low-end quarterback ones was comparable to that of the low-end quarterback ones and the low-end quarterback twos. 21.7% advantage of the high-end quarterback ones to the low-end quarterback ones, a 30.4% advantage from the low-end quarterback ones to the low-end quarterback twos. And then finally, high-end quarterback twos were virtually worthless compared to low-end quarterback twos. We only saw a 10.4% point-per-game advantage, whether you had, let's say, the quarterback 14 versus the quarterback 21 in points per game. So clearly shows your elite quarterback should be valued highly appropriately. But as we'll get into a second, we do see that in super flex drafts, some of these other quarterbacks get pushed up the board and you just can't fall into that trap. Yeah, and I mean, to put this in more simple terms, like an elite quarterback one would have been Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, Patrick Mahomes last year. Yep. Low-end quarterback one would have been Tua Tungavailoa, Geno Smith. Like, those guys were valuable, don't get us wrong, but 
obviously you would have, you know, noticed the difference between having a Jalen Hurts versus having a Geno Smith. And then, you know, also to your point too, like the Geno Smith difference versus, you know, uh, Aaron Rodgers and Russell Wilson and those guys that were more so like lower end QB twos last year, the difference was, you know, really negligible on any given week. You, you could have asked us to start sick question in any of our live streams and been like, should I start Russell Wilson in a good matchup or Geno Smith in a bad matchup? And we might've told you to start Russell Wilson versus if you told us, should I start Jalen hurts or should I start Russell Wilson? Like, obviously we would have said no matter who he's playing, you start Jalen hurts. And that's kind of the st uh, stark difference between these top end quarterbacks and between these middling guys. And why this matters so much from a super flex standpoint is because people hear super flex and they're like, okay, quarterbacks are more valuable they should go higher in drafts. And that's absolutely true of the elite quarterbacks. But the low-end, middling QB1s like Tua to Geno Smith to Aaron Rodgers to Russell Wilson, those guys don't really gain that much value because there's not a huge difference between them and the guys going way later like your Ryan Tannehill types, Desmond Ritter, Sam Howell, guys like that this year. So one thing that people, I think, often overrate, and underdog fantasy is the sharpest market you can find when it comes to Superflex, and this ADP that you guys can see on the screen is from their Superflex contest this summer. They have all the top quarterbacks going really high. Mahomes, Hurts, Allen, Lamar, all those guys going first five, first seven players off the board. But the one thing I disagree with is the fact that they have like a Tua Tunga Vailoa going in the first round over, you know, CeeDee Lamb, Stefan Diggs, Christian McCaffrey, B. John Robinson, all those guys. Um, because we've just kind of pointed out that the difference between a guy like Tua Tunga Vailoa, assuming he does what he did last year, is not that much different from a guy that you could probably get in like the fourth, fifth round of a super flex draft or comparatively from a one quarterback perspective, your like eighth round quarterback is not that different from your 14th round quarterback. 100%. And if you're just thinking about, lo uh, about it logically, your top three quarterbacks there, obviously Patrick Mahomes, Jalen Hurts, and Josh Allen. And a one quarterback league, these guys are still going within the first two rounds. On average, you'll see these guys go at the back end of the second in the majority of your leagues. However, once we get down to Tua Tonga Vailoa, who is going in the first round of underdog fantasy ADP, this guy's going in the ninth, tenth round of your home league. So if you're just doing the math right there, I would much rather take the guy going at the back end of the second in one quarterback leagues in the top five versus taking at the end of the first round, a guy typically going in the ninth, tenth round area. Honestly, the best comparable for it would be in a one quarterback league, how we kind of look at the running back position where the elite guys are clearly the elite guys. We want them on our teams. Low end running back ones, you know, we'll take them pretty valuable, but definitely not compared to the top six guys. And we want to be avoiding the RB2s. We want to be avoiding the running back 14, running back 15 on a year to year basis because it's way more replaceable than the top end guys. That type of theory, that type of dynamic in a one quarterback league to running backs also applies to the quarterback position in your super flex leagues. Yeah, I think just the nature of the way the NFL works, there's never going to be like 25 elite quarterbacks across the, across the NFL landscape. There's like six or eight, six to eight guys that are having great seasons, maybe another five to seven guys that are having solid seasons. And then the rest of the quarterbacks are considered, you know, probably players that teams want to move on from the next off season. That's just the way that the NFL works. It's the way that the competition is set up. So um, with the, with the quarterback position, you definitely do not want to be elevating mid quarterback twos and low end quarterback twos to the point that you're drafting them over high end wide receivers, high end running backs, and that kind of thing. And in this chart, this kind of further ex uh, explains this point. You can start to see the value over replacement, which basically just means when they're in your starting lineup, how much more valuable are they than the rest of their position? And, you know, your Jalen Hurts, Mahomes, Josh Allen types are right there at the top. Those top five quarterbacks are a higher value over replacement than the rest of the quarterback position. You see a little bit of a drop off after the top five quarterbacks. And then you see another drop off after the top 10 quarterbacks or so. And then quarterback 16 to 30, there's literally no value over replacement. There's very little difference, especially in a managed league where you can choose matchups and stream and pick up waivers and that kind of thing in having the quarterback 16 versus the quarterback 30. There's weeks where you can play a Jimmy Garoppolo, a Ryan Tannehill, a guy that's probably in that quarterback 25 to 30 range over guys that are in the quarterback 16 range. So it is not very advantageous in super flex leagues to overvalue mid quarterback twos. That is the point that we absolutely are hammering home here. Um, other considerations for super flex, and then we'll get into the actual mock draft is that stacking becomes more valuable. And our buddy Ron Stewart actually did an entire video on stacking in one quarterback leagues and home leagues specifically, why it can be more valuable. And he pulled this chart 
um, the same one from this Rotoviz article from Sean Siegel. And basically, it showcases the difference in win rate between Travis Kelsey, who obviously was a massive league winner last year, 27.5% win rate without Patrick Mahomes in his team con uh, uh, constructions. And when he was stacked with Patrick Mahomes, 41.3%. It's because when you draft Travis Kelsey at the end of the first round or early second round like you had to last year, you're inherently making the bet that Travis Kelsey is going to smash. He's going to be better than every other tight end in fantasy. And having Patrick Mahomes be a part of that bet means that if Kelsey's really good, there's a good chance that his quarterback is also really good as well. And this doesn't have to be at the extreme side of these cases where it's Mahomes, Kelsey, or obviously elite players at their position, and we know they're really good. Even if you're taking lower end stabs at players, even if you're taking Jahan Dotson, it makes you make yourself right twice by then also taking a Sam Howell to stack up with him or, um, you know, middling side of things where you take CeeDee Lamb at the end of the first round. You can also take Dak Prescott later on in your draft because if CeeDee Lamb has a great season, then there's a good chance that Dak had a great season. So stacking, we know how important it is in best ball. We know it can be important in home leagues, but especially in super flex, you can really, really uh, see the fruits of your labor when you stack up a big time hit in the early rounds with his quarterback or vice versa. Well, 100%, just contextualizing it in general, you're consolidating your bets. If you have, in a super flex league, your two quarterbacks, and you stack them each with, let's say, one option. Hypothetically, you have Jalen Hurts, and you have, I don't know, if you get lucky, maybe Deshaun Watson. If you're stacking them with Devontae Smith or A.J. Brown and with, like, Elijah Moore— you're making two bets. You're making the bets that the Eagles offense and the Browns offense will both be good. Whereas if you have Jalen Hurts, Deshaun Watson, and you have two unstacked wide receivers with them, then you're making four bets total. Because obviously, of course, you're making the Eagles bet. You're making the Browns bet. But you're also making the bets of the wide receivers on different teams. Basically, you're just giving yourself more leeway to be right because you're making less bets overall on certain offenses. Yeah, absolutely. And the last point that we're going to get into before we get into the mock is that running backs inherently sometimes gain value in these formats and wide receivers can lose value. And the reason being is that you're typically taking away a flex spot to add a super flex. So that means you can start less wide receivers, which means strategies like double hero RB and hero RB are a little bit more appealing than a, a, a traditional zero RB. Although we did talk about in the zero RB video, how effective it can be in super flex formats, but most super flex leagues will not have, you know, three wide receiver spots and two flexes on top of having a super flex. That's just a very deep starting roster. And also league winning running backs, like, you know, your 2019 Christian McCaffrey, 2017 Todd Gurley, you know, those type of massive, massive seasons will be more inflated win rates in super flex because the starting roster is more deep. The deeper the format is, the better that those players will perform value over replacement. Like I talked about with the quarterbacks, the same way it would, if you had Christian McCaffrey in 2019 and you were playing in a 16 team league, you probably were miles ahead of everybody else in your league because the value that Christian McCaffrey brought to your uh, roster and to your lineup was miles better than most of the players that those guys could have possibly had in one single lineup spot in their roster. So um, before we get into this uh, thing, one thing we will talk about throughout the mock is typically drafting three quarterbacks is optimal. You guys can see on the screen the average regular season score pulled from best ball contests of Superflex nature and then the min and max scores. It gives you the best balance by having three quarterbacks. Sure, you can get cute and draft two elite quarterbacks. Let's say Josh Allen and Trevor Lawrence fall to you and you can stack up those two guys and not draft another quarterback. And if those guys stay healthy, then you're probably going to be really good. Um, but at the same time, you probably want to give yourself a little bit of uh, of outs. The only way I would not draft three quarterbacks is if I got two absolute studs, like I just kind of mentioned there. Yeah, 100%. And even if you want to draft a third at that point, you should not be drafting the Derek Carrs of the world. You should not be drafting the Jordan Loves of the world. You're banking on those guys giving you the majority of your production. Get a guy like Ryan Tannehill. You only need him to be your quarterback three. Like we already mentioned, the mid uh, mid end quarterback twos versus literally the worthless quarterback 28 in points per game. Very negligible in terms of points per game difference. So if you have two elite guys, you can literally just punt quarterback three until literally like the last starting quarterbacks off the board. Yeah. Or you could take a big upside swing on like uh, a Sam Howell who can run or, you know, somebody yep. like that would also make some sense. And you, I mean, you could obviously still trade in these formats as well. So enough mumbo jumbo, like we talked about, we're going to get right into this mock draft. And unlike the other videos, we don't know where we're going we're gonna to pick from. We're going to pick from wherever the board decides that we pick from. So this will be an interesting wrinkle and we'll talk about th uh, some super flex strategy, of course, throughout the mock. All right, so we are now into the mock draft. Like I said, it is going to be a super flex mock as has been the theme of this entire video. Uh, starting roster spots, obviously you can start up to two quarterbacks with the super flex, two running backs, two wide receivers, two flexes. 
standard, you know, PPR format. I guess that's an oxymoron, but I was drawn the 12 spot and Danny was drawn the six spot. So Danny's probably going to be in the territory where he gets one of those elite quarterbacks. I'm probably going to be in a spot where I potentially need to reach or potentially I punt the quarterback position by taking the value elsewhere. We'll kind of see how this, uh, how this draft ends up uh, materializing here. Yep. So we do see uh pretty standard first three picks. You, you pretty much expecting that in every single super flex format. And I do have a player that I have relatively close to that top tier. So obviously Mahomes, Allen and Hertz are the top three quarterbacks for me in a one quarterback league. I value Lamar Jackson as a third round type of pick. So Getting him here in a super flex at the sixth overall spot. We already mentioned how elite quarterback ones can be a true, true game changer. I think Lamar Jackson is just that. So I will take him here. Yeah, that definitely makes some sense. So we see, again, more difference makers going off the board. I've also seen some theory and some posturing that, you know, elite tight ends might actually have more value in uh, in super flex formats as well, because similar to what I said with the running back position, the value of a replacement of a guy like Travis Kelsey can really help contribute to your team. So I uh, I get lucky, I think, here, and Trevor Lawrence ends up falling to me. I, I think he is one of my last anchor quarterbacks that I'm really comfortable with, and I'm probably not going to uh, go with another quarterback here. As much as I love Deshaun Watson, I think um, I, I I can't really I pass going. on uh, on on Bijan Robinson or Tyreek Hill in this spot. I've been drafting a crap ton of Bijan Robinson in a lot of these strategy videos, so I'm going to mix it up. And I'm going to go with Tyreek Hill here. Um, and see how kind of my team develops. So I get myself an anchor quarterback, an anchor wide receiver, and then we'll see kind of what falls to us um, at the next spots. And if you guys want our super flex uh, rankings, they're available in our redraft rankings uh, manifesto 2.0. Our draft guide is available for free. If you guys want to sign up over on underdog fantasy and deposit just $10, you'll get our entire super flex rankings, one quarterback rankings, positional, all that stuff is available in the draft guide for free, just for signing up on underdog using code FSE. So uh, Danny, what are you thinking? on the board right now. Yeah. So I'm on the board right now. And honestly, I have one quarterback left that I view as potentially not only having low end quarterback upside or low end quarterback one upside, but could potentially enter that top six if he does reclaim his form. So we just mentioned how you don't want to overinvest in quarterback, but if Deshaun Watson's going to fall to me in the middle of the second round, I do think he has that potential to be a 22, 23, 24 point per game level score on that Browns team. Obviously we know he can contribute with both his arm and his legs. So I will take him here at the two seven because we do see B. John Robinson, of course, go off the board. If he had fallen, like you kind of contemplate at your pick, I would have taken him over Deshaun Watson. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting because the way that like we showed with the underdog ADP is that they had Watson, Tua, guys like that at the end of the first round. The way that my Superflex rankings are done is that Watson is the last guy that I would spend a, a top two round draft pick on because the, the value at the wide receiver in the running back position is just such that I can't pass on them, as we talked about throughout the video, for Tua, for Dak, for Kirk Cousins, who are more so low-end quarterback one, high-end quarterback two type of archetypes. So for me, there's a pretty large gap. Like I have Deshaun Watson as my 17th overall player in my Superflex rankings. My next rated quarterback is not till 28 with Kirk Cousins. So I do have like a, a sizable gap from like a mid second round pick to like a late third round pick between that area. And I would say because the quarterback position is a scarce position, especially in super flex and people, you know, when things get scarce, it starts to create a value and a panic and everybody wants to pound quarterbacks at that point. If you're at a spot in your draft, like Danny is where you got Lamar Jackson to Sean Watson, you're probably going to be the beneficiary of some good value at other positions because people are going to try and catch up at quarterback. Yeah, 100%. So uh, I'm looking overall at the board here. And the two main considerations for me would be my highest ranked wide receiver, which is Calvin Ridley, and my highest ranked running back left, which would be actually Josh Jacobs. So uh, looking at the wide receiver board, I do see Calvin Ridley's a little bit lower on. However, I'm a little bit nervous you might take him on the turn. What about um, Andrews? I could have Andrews as well. Andrews is actually right after them. So I have Ridley at 21st overall, uh, Josh Jacobs at 23, and Andrews at 25. But you did mention that tight ends do gain value in this format because we're relying upon one less of a flex player. So, you know what? That's actually a good call. I will go with Andrews and favor him because of the format. Yeah, not to mention what we talked about throughout the video too, which is, you know, make yourself right twice. You have Lamar Jackson. If Lamar Jackson smashes, is a good chance that Mark Andrews smashes as call. well. That was that, I thought you were going to take two seconds to make that pick. I thought maybe you just didn't uh, notice, but uh, definitely I something that, that I uh, that we, we want to hammer home for sure. If it... it if you're in a super flex draft and you have the chance to stack up these premier guys with their pass catchers, you, you really need to take advantage of it. And yep. speaking of which, I'm going to do the exact same thing. My highest yep. ranked wide receiver is Calvin Ridley. I have Trevor Lawrence on my team. So I'm going to grab Calvin Ridley here. 
Let's look back at the quarterback position. Do I see a big difference here is the real question. This is kind of like a pivot point, right? Because if I don't take a quarterback because I'm picking at the 12 spot, I'm going to have to wait a while. And in an actual draft, there's a good chance that five, six, seven quarterbacks go off the board. But am I okay, you know, potentially waiting until Jordan Love, Matthew Stafford, Kyler Murray area? Or do I want to secure somebody like Daniel Jones, like Mm -hmm. uh, Aaron Rodgers, like Anthony Richardson on the board? I'm going to look around at the other positions and kind of make my determination at that point. Do I want to pass on some of those guys? So for me, I'm looking at the at the tight end position, at the wide receiver position, at the running back position. I do really think that Josh Jacobs is probably a hair ahead of where I would have a guy like Daniel Jones. So what I'm going to do is probably punt the quarterback position all the way back to the fifth round, and hopefully something can uh, can fall back to me here. So I wasn't trying to venture um, for a running back, but I think Josh Jacobs kind of represents a tear break for me. It sounds like he's going to report the camp. I'm not overly concerned about, uh, the holdout at this point in time. So get myself an anchor running back to go along with two wide receivers. Obviously I inherently made that bet on that Jacksonville offense. When I took Trevor Lawrence, one twelve. I fortify that bet by taking Calvin Ridley at three twelve. Cause if, if Lawrence smashes good chance that Calvin Ridley smashes as well. Yeah, 100%. The only quarterback actually at your spot I probably would have considered there would have actually just been Anthony Richardson because like we kind of said, we are chasing quarterbacks that can enter that elite point per game tier. And out of all the quarterbacks listed, the clear one that I think has that level of upside would be Anthony Richardson. And that's the thing. Like, again, we are treating the quarterbacks like the running back positions. As you guys would have saw on our zero running back video, double hero running back video, hero running back video, we're drafting running backs in one quarterback leagues based off their overall ceiling. Like we are not drafting, you know, a safe projectable player. We want them to enter that upper echelon. So if we're treating that the same way for the quarterback position in Superflex, Anthony Richardson, I believe, is the one quarterback there that kind of fits different than Daniel Jones, Aaron Rodgers, and the other guys listed there. But I'm looking at the board here and again, stacking opportunity here with Amari Cooper. However, I do see that he's a few picks down the board and I do think I could potentially get him at the next pick, especially with team five needing a quarterback and team two and three only having one quarterback on their roster who could potentially reach on guys like Daniel Jones, Aaron Rodgers, et cetera there. So for me personally, I do see a tier break at running back. I will go with Jameer Gibbs and hope that Amari Cooper falls back. Worst case scenario, I miss out on Amari Cooper. I can always just just pivot towards Elijah Moore to stack up Sean Watson later on. Yeah. Cooper looks like he went off the board at the turn. Um, thankfully not a ton of quarterbacks in my, from my perspective have gone off the board. It looks like I might actually have a chance to get a decent one on the way back at five twelve. Yep. A hundred percent. Unfortunately, like we said, Amari Cooper did go off the board at the five one again, no panic. I can always transition to a guy like Elijah Moore later on. For me personally, I'm looking at the wide receiver position and my next rated player would be Jerry Judy. So don't want to fall too far behind the eight ball there. I will select him. I'm actually so mad that you just did that because I thought there was a decent chance that uh, Russell Wilson would fall back to me and he did. So I was Oof. hoping that Judy would fall to me also and I could double tap Russell turn. Wilson and Jerry Judy at the turn spot there. So um, I'm on the board again. I, uh, it's two wide receiver, two flex league. So, I mean, you know, typically you want to be strong at those positions. You want to be strong through the flex. I think that George Kittle kind of represents a tear break for me at tight end. So I really do like him. I think he's definitely gonna be one of my picks here. Um, and then I probably can't afford to punt quarterback yet again. I don't think I can, I can be like, oh, I'm just not going to draft another quarterback. I have concern about this Russell Wilson, Denver Broncos team, but I I believe Sean Payton's a really good coach. And I do believe he has the highest ceiling and and probably also one of the safer projections in this area, assuming he can get back to his previous like 11 year of his career form. So, I mean, if we're, if we're going by statistical outliers, it looks like last year was an outlier for Russell Wilson, especially with better coaching on the board. So I'm a little annoyed that I didn't get Jerry Judy to stack up with him, but he has some later round options that I could potentially go after if I want to. 100%. And I'm back on the clock here. This is uh, honestly a one quarterback range dead zone. We do see once I realistically took Gibbs and ETN went off the board, maybe you consider Walker uh, in that range. But regardless, once you get to Mixon, Dobbins, Aaron Jones, et cetera, the rounds five to eight area in a super flex would be like the rounds four to six, four to seven area in a one quarterback league in terms of the running back dead zone. So I will not select my second running back here because I personally can't take Damian Pierce, Miles Sanders, DeAndre Swift, et cetera, there over a guy like Christian Watson, who I think can have a breakout second year on that Green Bay offense and does give me my second wide receiver. So looks like I will be actually exacting a hero RB. Uh, big shout out to that, of course, getting Mark Andrews at the three six as being the reason why. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I definitely considered going with um, a double tap of Christian Watson and Jordan Love with my last pick because I, I could have done that. It just felt a little early to me on Love. Like I, I'm fine yeah. taking Christian Watson that high, but I figured uh, getting Kittle there because, you know, Purdy goes late enough that I think I might be able to stack him up with uh, with his tight end. Yep. No, I agree with you there. My next highest rated wide receiver would also be Mike Williams. So I will uh, keep going with the Hero RB and build up a few wide receivers here. Yep, definitely makes sense. A bunch of wide receivers go off the board here. I'm I'm pretty thin at that position as of now because I deviated for Josh Jacobs. I deviate for another quarterback and I deviate for George Kittle. So I'm I'm a little worried about falling behind the eight ball here. I'm already pretty stable at the quarterback position. I think I can wait yet another uh, pick away for uh, somebody like Brock Purdy or Sam Howell or you know somebody later on as potentially my third quarterback. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take some guys um, Calvin Ridley and Tyree kill. Give me some flexibility to go after somebody. Maybe that's in a little bit worse of an offense. I believe quite a bit that, uh, Deontay Johnson could have a big time breakout season, you know, not breakout cause he's already been very good, but he's a guy that I think, uh, has a high target share potential. And, uh, the, the, um, situation there in Pittsburgh is also something that could open up the offense with Kenny Pickett potentially taking a step forward. And realistically, I could actually take Kenny Pickett right now if I want to. Um, I'm probably not going to because I just spent a sixth round pick on Russell Wilson. If Pickett was, you know, were, were to fall back to me, I might go in that direction. Um, but sense. I'm going to take one more player here that's probably going to give me another shot at an elite offense. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm betting that the Broncos offense takes a step forward. So why not yeah. the engine of said offense? Uh, Javante Williams seems to be healthy, uh, you know, performing in uh, in practice. Should be back on the field pretty soon for preseason action in week two. So. I'll take Javante Williams there at the eight one. If Russell Wilson takes a big step forward, that's going to be huge for Javante. Um, now I'm in a tough spot because my highest rated running back here would be a guy like David Montgomery, but uh, of course I have Jameer Gibbs, so that would be counterintuitive to playing for upside. Could go with a guy like Isaiah Pacheco there. Uh, obviously, my plan is whether it's the ninth or tenth round to potentially get Elijah Moore to stack with. Uh, Deshaun Watson, of course, I don't have to take him now given his current ADP listed down. So, um, a running back, you know what? I will take the shot on Isaiah Pacheco at this point, get my second running back to pair with Jameer Gibbs. I think eight sevens a uh, palpable price for him. Yeah, that makes sense. And I just want to direct your guys' attention to the board, right? Like we talked about these low end QB ones, high end QB twos, Tua goes at the three, one Kirk cousins at the three, nine. And while I don't think those picks are like outrageous values, I just look at the players that went around them, right? Like the the Derrick Henrys of the world, Brees Hall. You get access to like elite upside players at the running back and wide receiver position. And I think, why would I want to take Kirk Cousins over Brees Hall at the 3-9 when I could have taken Russell Wilson at the 6-1, who realistically don't project all that differently, or Aaron Rodgers at the 5-8, or yep. you know, Jared Goff at the 5-9. It To me, it makes sense to be at the tail end of this tier, of your quarterback too. If you're not going to go double elite quarterback early, like Danny did. And I'm kind of glad the draft worked out this way because yeah. you can see perspectives. Um, it makes sense to kind of just wait till the tail end of that tier. Kind of like I did there with Russell Wilson, Kyler Murray, also somebody that is a very wow. um, intriguing option in super flex formats, because me and Danny have both been very much of the belief that he's not going to take, you know, 10 weeks to get back on the field. And obviously in super flex, he's going to be a big time wins over replacement guy. If he plays 13 games this year, he's probably going to help people win. Kenny Pickett fell back to me. So I can't, pa I can't pass on him. I already made the bet on Deontay Johnson. Pretty easy to just take Kenny Pickett here as my quarterback three going to need some more, uh, going to need some more wide receiver talent. I already have my two, you know, anchor running backs with, uh, Javante Williams and with Josh Jacobs. Uh, Gabe Davis has been a guy that I've been grabbing a lot of. So I'm going to kind of continue that like trend it. here. He's a guy, especially as my second flex. I want a guy that has a high weekly ceiling. My wide receiver core overall has a lot of attachment to great offenses. Tyreek Hill, Calvin Ridley, Gabe Davis, Deontay Johnson, really the only guy that, you know, is coming from a shaky offense, which I talked about in the hero RB and double hero RB strategies. I love drafting a lot of wide receivers from good teams. And obviously if I'm taking Deontay, I'm taking the bet that the Steelers take a step forward. Hence why I took Kenny Pickett as well. Yep. And that's exactly the reason why I'm taking Elijah Moore here. Like I referenced last round, if he had fallen to me at the 10, seven, he was going to be my pick. So now I'm actually hoping that one quarterback in particular falls back to me and it does give me a stack. And it looks like he did fall back. I will be selecting Sam Howell here again, made the bet on Jahan Dotson. So taking Sam Howell, I get my third stack, get my quarterback three. I think 11th round is a palpable price. And again, he's a low end quarterback too, realistically, but he's got legs. He's young. He's got the upside to potentially, you know, best case scenario. He was your quarterback one last year of cycle. 
if he ends up being, you know, a low end quarterback one this year, I would not be surprised again, very, very high expectations, but out of all the quarterbacks listed here, he's mobile. He's got a good offense. And again, I already made the bet on Jahan Dotson. Yeah. So after I uh, double tap this turn here, we're going to skip to the end of the draft and kind of show you guys how our teams ended up shaking out. I see a couple bets that make a lot of sense for me. I need some more wide receiver depth. Rashad Bateman's a guy that I think Yep. realistically, if you told me Zay Flowers, Odell Beckham Jr. or Rashad Bateman, let's say one of them becomes like a top 30 wide receiver, top 24 wide receiver in points per game. I could realistically throw them all in a hat and tell you, I, I have no idea which one it's going to be. So just yep. give me the shot on Rashad Bateman there. And then not that I intended to go with four quarterbacks, but I just think Brock Purdy's too good of a price to pass up here. I can always make trades. Make I can it. always, maybe some team suffers an injury and I could package together Brock Purdy and Russell Wilson and go up and get a better quarterback or Brock Purdy and Kenny Pickett and go up and get a better quarterback. For me, this is just a strict value pick. I just, I can't pass on him at this point in the draft. So after I make this pick, we'll skip to the end. All right. So we are now to the end of the draft. Like I said, we're going to go over our teams real quick. I go Trevor Lawrence in the first round. I get myself an anchor quarterback who I believe, you know, has a high, high ceiling. He's like top six in MVP odds, according to Vegas right now. Tyree Kill at the 2-1 to me is just too good a value to pass up. He's a top four player for me in one quarterback league, so I can't reasonably take a guy like Deshaun Watson or some of these other guys. Could have gone with Bijan there as well, but I take Bijan all the time, so I figured I'd mix it up. Uh, Calvin Ridley at the 312 to stack up with my Lawrence. You love to see that. Anchor running back with Josh Jacobs. George Kittle, great value pick at the end of the fifth. Um, Russell Wilson, also I thought I got pretty decent value there. Another wide receiver with Deontay who's got a high target share. I correlate my my Broncos bet by taking Javante Williams there. If Russell Wilson takes a step forward, good chance Javante punches in a bunch of touchdowns. And then I stack up Kenny Pickett with Deontay Johnson, Gabe Davis and Rashad Bateman, some flyers on some good offenses. Brock Purdy stacked up with George Kittle, even though I I mean, I, I didn't intend to stack up all four of my quarterbacks with a weapon of theirs, but it inherently makes my team very good if my four bets pan out. If the Jags are good, if the 49ers are good, if the Broncos are better than people think, and the Steelers are better than people think, there's a good chance my team is going to absolutely crush this fantasy league because that's only like four bets for a 15-round draft. If they all hit, then I'm going to have a bunch of uh, a bunch of stud breakout candidates and a bunch of stud win rate players. So um, grabbing Raheem Mostert and Ty Chandler to kind of close out my running back core. I went a little lighter than I would like to in overall numbers at running back, but knowing that I have Jacobs to anchor one of my spots, Javante to anchor the other spot, um, I can always churn my waiver wire. If Mingo doesn't, you know, get the snaps right away, I could churn him for another running back. If I trade away one of these quarterbacks, I could get a running back in return. So there's a lot of options. A lot of times people just look at the draft and think, oh, that's it. This is the team for the rest of the year. Like your team's going to change a lot. You're going to make trades. You're going to add players. So this is, you know, we always talk about it. The, the draft is where you build the foundation. The rest of the the, the league is kind of where um, you make your money there. So you are on the uh, on the spotlight. Let's see what you got. Yeah, 100%. I started off double tapping uh, potential elite quarterbacks, in my opinion. Again, I already referenced how elite, how advantageous top six quarterback finishers in terms of points per game are. And I do think both Lamar Jackson specifically is going to finish as a top six quarterback. But I do think if Deshaun Watson gets back to the level of play we've seen in the past, you guys know how high we are on Deshaun Watson. I think he could be an also uh, as well a top six quarterback. So for me personally, getting them at the two seven there. Absolute steal. Mark Andrews at the 3-6 gives me a stacking option with Lamar Jackson. Also, as we mentioned, tight ends are inherently more, invalu uh, more valuable in this league as we get rid of a flex spot. Jameer Gibbs to be my hero running back here at the 4-7. Triple tap wide receivers here with Jerry Judy, Christian Watson, and Mike Williams. Isaiah Pacheco, I think at the 8-7 is a palpable spot, like I mentioned. Could run in some touchdowns. Give me some RB2 production there. I don't mind him at the 8-7. And then finally, we do see Jahan Dotson, who you'll see in a couple picks. I later stack with Sam Howell. And Elijah, Elijah Moore, of course, to give me a stack with Deshaun Watson. Once I got back to these last four rounds, I just pounded back a lot of ambiguous backfields. Uh, Jarek McKinnon, I guess I do have Isaiah Pacheco, but there's a reasonable opportunity for both of them to thrive in fantasy. Isaiah Pacheco being that between the tackles, goal line running back for the Kansas City Chiefs. Jarek McKinnon, obviously, to be their pass catcher. This is basically making the bet that Clyde edwards Hilaire either is not involved or maybe gets cut in training camp because Daenerys Prince is outshining him. That's basically the bet that this is going to be the two-man backfield of that Kansas City offense. And then finally, the last three picks, Roshan Johnson, ambiguous backfield rookie running back. Chase Brown, elite handcuff to that Cincinnati Bengals offense. Plus, we don't believe in Joe Mixon. And then finally, ending off with Gus Edwards, who could, you know, give me some production at the early portion of the season. One of the more efficient backs in the entire NFL. And as we know, J.K. Dobbins with his holdout, with his injury, don't exactly know what's going on there. So I do think getting Gus Edwards in the 15th round gives me a lot of leverage. 
Yeah, and if if again you're making some bets here with this Ravens offense, Lamar and Andrews were two of your first three picks. If if Dobbins gets injured, but the offense is still good, then Gus Edwards obviously is going to look like a really good pick there. So again, in Superflex leagues, there's a lot going on. There's a lot that you need to worry about. Minimizing the amount of bets that you need to make is definitely something that I would highly, highly encourage by stacking up, especially when you take a quarterback early to draft, you know, one of their pass catching weapons or, you know, correlations within their offense, like kind of what I did there with Russell Wilson and Javante Williams. Um, real quick, I just want to go over the quarterback landscape. We see all these top quarterbacks go off the board in the first two rounds. I would say, again, Watson would be the last guy that I would spend a top two round pick on. Then you see, you know, your Tua's, your Dax, your Kirk Cousins of the world fill out like the rounds two to three range. I would say the next Next tier of quarterbacks is going to vary league to league. If people start panicking, you're going to see Tua's, Dax, Kirk Cousins, Geno, Aaron Rodgers, Daniel Jones. Those guys start to get pushed up the board more and more. The, the less experienced people are in super flex formats. And in those type of leagues, I would highly suggest waiting till the end of that tier, Get waiting for Jared Goff, waiting for Russell Wilson, waiting for Bryce Young, waiting for Matthew Stafford and, and Kyler Murray, Jordan Love, Kenny Pickett, those type of guys. Because realistically, as we talked about, there's not a massive, massive difference between the high end QB2s and there is on the lower end QB2s. And also, some of my favorite values by the looks of this, if this is draft is any indication are going to be your riskier assets like Brock Purdy, like Sam Howell, like Kyler Murray, those type of guys are perfect quarterback threes, whether you got two elite quarterbacks like Danny did early, or whether you kind of got one elite quarterback and one mid QB two, like I did. Yeah, 100%. I also want to reference that in this room, we see honestly, from a, an ADP standpoint, a very, you know, reasonable ADP. We do see, the Dak Prescott, Deshaun, or not even Deshaun Watson, Dak Prescott, Tua Tungavailoa, Kirk Cousins of the world, fall to the late second, early third round, uh, Kirk Cousins' case, late third round area. As we mentioned on Underdog right now, very winnable over there. Tua Tungavailoa is going at the end of the first round. 10 of the first 12 picks over there are currently quarterbacks. So what that tells you is that if you can stock up on some elite positional players where people are taking Tua Dungavailoa, Kirk Cousins, Jared Goff, Aaron Rodgers, et cetera, they're way too early comparative to where you're getting the money on sleeper. You can build out a phenomenal positional core and then still backfill with, even if you wanted to wait to, let's say, just say hypothetically, your quarterback two was Russell Wilson, your quarterback three was Ryan Tannehill, and the rest of your roster is like Justin Jefferson, um, a monitor St. Brown, uh, Jameer Gibbs, et cetera, there, you're already going to win at every other spot where, like we mentioned in a one quarterback, we're trying to win our flexes, win our tight end, win our quarterback position and fade running backs. It would be the inverse to that where we're treating that like the quarterback position in super flex. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same. It's the same uh, principle where people are going to reach for, for middle and quarterbacks. It's the same as when, you know, your, your dumb league mate takes Damian Pierce in the middle of the second round, like, cause people are going to do it in some leagues. Yeah. And, uh, that's exactly what we want to avoid. So I would say the most crucial part of, of determining super flex and, and strategy and stuff is evaluate constantly evaluating the board. When you see how the quarterbacks are being treated in your league, you want to act fast. You want to be the person that starts the runs. You don't want to be the person that is at the end of the run. You also, if a run happens ahead of you, you don't want to reach and make sure that you're just getting a quarterback. So you're not screwed at that position. Good chance that if they start those runs and if they have those quarterbacks already on their roster, then you can kind of, you know, fade kind of what the rest of your league is doing and get later quarterbacks. Um, and I do think, you know, the quarterback league winners would be a very helpful video for you guys who are playing super flex uh, leagues to watch. So definitely I will uh, link that down below. And it's also, if you just search who is the next league winning quarterback fantasy stock exchange, you'll find that as well. So um, if you made it to the end of this video, like I said, you can get our super flex rankings, our overall rankings, all that stuff by going to uh, underdog fantasy and uh, depositing just $10 using the code FSE. You'll get our entire draft guide for free, which has a lot of super flex content, a lot of quarterback stuff in there. Uh, very applicable to this video. If you enjoyed, leave a like, subscribe to the channel. If this is the first time you're checking us out, comment down below what you thought of this video or what you think of Superflex in general. But with that being said, peace out. We'll talk to you soon.